Belfast, Northern Ireland, where the security forces are ever visible, where also ordinary people try to go about their daily lives. Close to the Springfield Road, Jim McCabe begins his day getting his three children ready for school. You're going to have that shirt black. Whiskey Jim McCabe has had to cope with his three children on his own ever since his 33-year-old wife was killed on the morning of July the 8th, 1981. She was a very uh, kind person, you know. She had a very big heart. I mean, sometimes I objected to... I mean, she couldn't see uh, a dog in the street, the cat in the street. It had to be brought in. She was an animal aware. I mean, she treated people the same way, you know. I mean, a very friendly, very open person. Uh, a loving person, you know. I mean. <laughs> Nora's youngest child was only three months old when her mother was killed. The morning that she died, Nora had gone out early. A neighbour of mother's came to the door and I heard her saying that that fella's wife has been hit by a plastic bullet. And I didn't in no way that I connect this myself. Mother came in and she said, Jim, you better go over. Nora has been hit by a plastic bullet. She'd been taken to the Royal Victoria Hospital for emergency surgery. It took about six, I think it was about six hours surgery. Then she was brought to intensive care, where uh, the doctor told us that uh, the brain damage was extensive, that if she did live, her uh, speech and sight, I think, would be effective would be affected and that uh, it wasn't the it was a very serious injury and the, the brain damage was extensive because the whole left side here just behind the ear where it struck her the, the the bones been shattered and scattered throughout the brain and she died uh, shortly after two o'clock on the following day The autopsy recorded that her injuries were consistent with those caused by a plastic baton round. Lawyer Pat Finnecane. They refer to as plastic bullets, but if the, the, uh, that name is rather misleading because they're made of PVC. They're about four inches long, one and a half inches in diameter, and uh, about as heavy as a cricket ball. And they leave the muzzle of the, uh, the gun that fires them at um, a speed of between 130 and 170 miles per hour. Plastic bullets have been used by the Royal Ulster Constabulary since 1978 and by the British Army since 1975. They're the standard anti-riot weapon. They replaced rubber bullets, which had caused a number of serious injuries and three deaths. Officially, plastic bullets are regarded as more accurate, but to date, they've killed 12 people and caused severe injuries to many more. Inquests have clearly ruled that five of those killed were not involved in riots at the time. Six of those who died were children. Stephen McConomy, 11. Julie Livingston, 14. Stephen Geddes, 10. Carol Ann Kelly, 12. Paul Witters, 15. Brian Stewart, 13. All of those who died were Catholics. The most sensational recent use of plastic bullets was seen all over the world on television when the RUC attempted to capture Martin Galvin, publicity director of Norade, at a Belfast rally. Numerous baton rounds were fired and this man, John Downs, was killed. Rules issued to the security forces prescribe the conditions when plastic bullets can be used they're not to be fired closer than 20 meters unless the safety of officers is threatened and they are to be fired only at the lower part of the body yet all those who've died so far had head or chest injuries 
Even so, finding in favour of the British government, the European Commission recently ruled that the use of plastic bullets was less dangerous than alleged. So, what did happen in Mrs McCabe's case? She died in Linden Street, here at the junction with the Falls Road. It was the morning that the death of the fourth hunger striker, Joe MacDonald, was announced. A group of women had been saying a rosary. One of them was hospital worker Jean Mooney. Well, I turned to come back up this road here, and as I crossed over this, this way for to get onto the other side of the road, the two Land Rovers came, were at the street, at the end of the road here, and it turned so quickly into the street that, I mean, I don't know why, but I just stopped dead. And when I happened to look, there was a lady at the corner who had also stopped. And then there was, the, I, I saw from where I was standing that there was a thick black thing sticking out of the side of the Land Rover. And the next thing was the bang and the smoke. And when I looked over, the lady was going down the, the wall. I run right out, straight across the road from the office, and Nora was lying over at this wall, and um, the blood was oozing out of her head, thick red blood. Um, I shouted for someone to get something to wrap around Nora, and someone handed me, I'm not sure whether it was a coat or a blanket, and I covered Nora up. Um, Nora at no stage recovered consciousness. At one stage, she, like a convulsion went through her body, she just seemed to shake the whole way right through. But what were the circumstances leading up to Mrs. McCabe's death? July the 8th was indeed the day that the fourth hunger striker died, as this news report recalls. As Joe McDonald's death was being reported on news bulletins, Republican supporters in West Belfast were taking to the streets. The blowing of whistles and the banging of dustbin lids drew large crowds into the early morning mist. In some areas during the day, clearly there were serious disturbances. The police have suggested that the situation was equally threatening on the Falls Road when Mrs. McCabe was shot around 7.45 a.m. In the coroner's court, the police described the scene as their two Land Rovers travelled up the Falls Road like this. There was bin lid banging and whistle blowing then. The road ahead was strewn with rubble and beer barrels. The lead vehicle was petrol bombed by a crowd. There were vehicles burning at this stage. The petrol bombs rained around us. I knew in my heart that we were then in a riot situation. Just then, petrol bombs were smashing around us. In charge of the patrol, the most senior policeman in West Belfast. This man, Chief Superintendent James Crutchley. He was a front seat passenger, and in fact, if it's right that this was the shot, the, 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 uh, the, um, the shot that killed Mrs. McCabe, he was the man who ordered the shot to be fired. His testimony echoed the story of the other officers. We were there attacked with petrol bombs and stones by these people. And your patrol was in danger at this stage. I ordered two members of my crew to fire one baton round each in the direction of this crowd to ensure our personal safety. Then, on our right, I saw two youths with petrol bombs. I could see that as they ran towards us, the bottles were alight. And I ordered witness A to discharge one button round at these youths, which he did. But, unknown to the police, a camera was recording the actual events. That was a turning point. I mean, the video was a turning point in the inquest. The cameraman was Jean-Pierre Plouf, a Canadian. We brought him back to this spot on the Falls Road, where he filmed in 1981. His crucial film of what the police had described as a riot has never been seen on television before. We arrived quite early, it was about uh, 6.30 in the morning. And it was very quiet except for a few women and children banging bin lids at the corner of Sebastopol and the Falls Road. About quarter to eight, we'd been filming for uh, approximately an hour or more. And uh, two Land Rovers going much slower than the previous Land Rovers that morning, carried on up the Falls Road and uh, shot some plastic bullets uh, not too far past Sevastopol. And once they got to the corner of Linden Street, the leading vehicle swerved to the right, stopped, and fired a plastic bullet. Land, 
Yeah. Yeah. The film reveals a number of discrepancies in the police evidence. One, the RUC said, debris on the road. The uh, police witnesses described a series of events or a sequence of events um, whereby they had to negotiate debris on the road. Beer barrels, which one would expect to have been fairly uh, conspicuous on the film, it didn't appear to be borne out at all. I saw no obstacles at all on the road. Uh, traffic was moving freely, there were taxis, there were army vehicles and police vehicles. Uh, some of the uh, testimonies state that there was uh, obstructions on Leeson Street and Spinner Street. There were, there were no obstructions on Leeson Street. There was one on Spinner Street, an overturned lorry. And uh, the Falls Road was completely unobstructed. Two, the RUC said petrol bombs rained down. Uh, there was no uh, uh, rainstorm of, of, plastic, uh, of petrol bombs uh, coming down around the two Land Rovers. Uh, in fact, the film does not disclose any uh, petrol bombs being thrown by anybody. I saw no petrol bombs at all on the Falls Road or on the side streets uh, going onto the Falls Road. There was no petrol bombs whatsoever. None whatsoever. Three, the RUC said a riot situation. There couldn't have been any riot situation because there were, there were no people um, throwing any petrol bombs or uh, concerting any threat. Uh, what they were doing was uh, banging bin lids and, uh, as a form of mourning, in fact, for the death of uh, the latest hunger striker, Joe McDonald. And the small rocks they were throwing were, are the kind of things that are thrown every day at the forces. Here. There were accounts of uh, 30 and 40 uh, People, I think uh, uh, Chief Superintendent Crutchley described 30 and 40 youths at Leeson Street. And uh, another witness said there were 70 or 80 people at Leeson Street attacking the Land Rovers. And this didn't appear at all in the film. Well, I wouldn't really say there was a riot taking place, but there was some stone throwing farther down the road here. It was really youngsters, you know, it wasn't growing up battles or anything. It was really kids and that were throwing a few stones, you know, at the jeeps as they passed. Four, the RUC said they never fired the fatal shot. The most striking thing of all was this peculiar manoeuvre that, that um, the witnesses agreed could only have been a deliberate action and uh, denied uh, having happened. And uh, there was certainly a veering manoeuvre described by the witness, uh, the eyewitness. So, did the leading Land Rover stop, suddenly change course, swing in toward Linden Street and fire from its offside, as Gene Mooney described? That's one version. Or did it, as the police said, stop and fire its offside shot into Clonard Street before reaching Linden Street and then continue? In court, the inspector in charge of the second Land Rover was emphatic. Under cross-examination, he said of the leading vehicle, I do not agree that it had turned right as to go into Linden Street. It would be a serious error to say that. And the officer who fired the shot from the offside of the first Land Rover said under caution. I can categorically deny that any rubber bullets were fired at or into Linden Street by any member of my crew. So could Gene Mooney have been wrong? The Land Rover came round that corner so quickly that I stopped. Well. There was, uh, as I say, there was the black thing protruding out of the side of the jeep. And then there was the bang. Obviously, the lady was hit on the side of the head. You know, they did do it. Back to the film. First, several shots are heard, and puffs of smoke are seen to the left. Both Land Rovers drive off, and the first one breaks, turns abruptly to the right, and fires. The person who finally removed any doubt that Gene Mooney's account of events was right was this man, another policeman, Detective Superintendent Alfred Entwistle. He was sent to Canada to track down the cameraman who shot the film. He then took photographs from the film and testified that, first, in his view, there was no evidence in the film of petrol bombs being thrown. 
Second, and more significantly, having examined the position of the Land Rover in the film, he took various measurements in the vicinity and reached a decisive conclusion that when it fired the shot, the Land Rover had reached the junction of Linden Street. A hearing before Belfast coroner James Elliott found no clear evidence to suggest that there was a legitimate target to be fired at in that street, and no evidence to suggest that the deceased was other than an innocent party. Well, when we filmed this, we didn't realize uh, the weight it would have. And um, having come back and uh, having met the husband of the woman that uh, was killed that morning, uh, I realized a tragedy had occurred. Without that video, in my eyes, another miscarriage of justice would not have been seen. People would have been done believing the R that the RUC didn't shoot Nora. Because they said they didn't. But when the video was shown to the jury, in their own words, they stated that they didn't believe the RUC evidence. In their words, there was no rioting, no petrol bombing, there was no legitimate target in Linton Street. The Director of Public Prosecution says the police will not be prosecuted either for the shooting or for perjury. Chief Superintendent Crutchley, the man in charge of the patrol, has been promoted to Assistant Chief Constable. I, mean, I think that's indecent. I mean, that's an insult. That's a slap in the teeth for me. Nora's family, my children, and in general, the people of Northern Ireland. Their, their vehicle was at no time in danger when they fired the shot. The jury even said that, more or less, that there was no legitimate target to be fired on in the street. I mean, that's what the jury's verdict was, that she was an innocent person. It is difficult for me, having kids as young as they are, publicize Nora's case. I want justice. And the person who pulled the trigger brought before a court to state under oath his reason for doing it. And only time will tell what the outcome will be. The norm for the course or the power for the course for Northern Ireland. Nothing. Nil. Zero. That's it.